Hi, I'm Apple Jinx. Let's start something. Now, I did this for BronyCon, and it was a thing designed for an audience, so I'll just pretend there's an audience out there somewhere. Give me a yay if you recognize any of these things, okay? Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by her sister on the bank and of having nothing to do. Once or twice she had peeped into the book her sister was reading it, but it had no pictures or conversations in it. And what is the use of a book, thought Alice, without pictures or conversations? Here's another. Sherlock Holmes took his bottle from the corner of the mantelpiece and his hypodermic syringe from its neat Morocco case. Try this one on for size. Fire roared through the bifurcated city of ankh morpork Far out in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy lies a small, unregarded yellow sun. In the week before their departure to Arrakis, when all the final scurrying about had reached a nearly unbearable frenzy, an old crone came to visit the mother of the boy, Paul. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of Number 4 Privet Drive were ver proud to say that they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. When Mr. Bilbo Baggins of Bag End announced that he would shortly be celebrating his 111st birthday with a party of special magnificence, there was much talk and excitement in Hobbiton. And then here's the clincher. Once upon a time, in the magical land of Equestria, there were two regal sisters who ruled together and created harmony for all the land. Writing matters. That's my point in doing that introduction there. I was trying to get the panel to kick off with a bang, and it seemed like an interesting way to do it. Point being, everything starts with writing. The creative universe is built on imagination, and when you think about it, you realize it generally all starts with words. Even things with pictures often start with words. Words are the single most direct way of getting to people's imaginations, and that's where you set up shop. This is a panel teaching people how to do compelling writing, notably novel writing. Now, my next heading, on my little list here, is Why Me? It's fair to ask why I think I could help. I ain't exactly penstroke. I've written more than half a million pony words, and more than half a million words of original fiction before that, but there will always be people who just write stuff endlessly. That's, you can't necessarily go by that. I've got only about 400, well, now it's 430 or so, watches on FIM fiction. I only got one fic on Equestria Daily, although it was the first one that I tried to get, and it, it ran pretty much unaltered from what I sent. And I only got featured once, briefly, on FIM Fiction for my fourth book. I am not one of the top 50 writers on FIM Fiction, but five of those top 50 writers follow me. It would be six, but Device Heretic unfollowed everybody one day. The reason I'm giving this, partly because um, not everybody was able to make this BronyCon panel, and it didn't get recorded that I saw, and even if it had, people were filtering in towards the end because I ran immediately after opening ceremonies, and opening ceremonies went over, as they will so often do. Should have seen that coming, but I didn't see it coming. I'm doing this over again for YouTube because I want to help you make words that matter. I want to give you the tools that have hooked and reeled in some of the best writers around and turn them into fans. To some extent, anyhow, they're, to some extent they're fans. I'm sure a fair amount of that is in spite of me. I write a weird genre, we don't have to get into that. My point being, this is about making continuing narrative functional, and you can apply this stuff to whatever you want. You certainly don't have to make books the way that I make them. You should make the books the way you make them. Now, maybe it might seem weird to go to that kind of trouble over My Little Pony fanfiction. By definition, it probably seems weird to go to that kind of trouble over My Little Pony fanfiction. So my question would be, then, why should fic count? Let's take a little historical perspective on pony fanfic compared to real art, or what you would quote-unquote real art. You'd think if you go back into, say, the Dutch master's oil paintings, you might get to a place that's about total creative inventiveness, some isolated painter miraculously making magic out of nothing, celebrated for his mastery, 
you'd be totally wrong, pretty much. I have an example. Uh, I didn't get it out to show you, but um, you can look it up on Google or whatever. The painting The Lace Maker by Dutch Master Vermeer. And no, of course, I don't have the painting, but I have a print of it. This is possibly the most valuable painting in the Louvre after the Mona Lisa. The Lace Maker is kind of like fan fiction as a painting. There was another Dutch painter, Kaspar Netscher. He made an amazing painting about six to eight years earlier than that, and it was called The Lace Maker as well. But it's Vermeer's that has more magic in it. There's something very special about Vermeer's. Now, why would Vermeer have seen other paintings? What were the Netherlands like that he lived in? Well, at the time that the lace maker was painted, literary millions, literally, not literary, literally millions of Dutch master paintings were being made. That was a creative community. It was a creative community busier than FIM fiction, which is what us pony writers have. And the artists made about as much money as the people on FIM fiction let me, let me put that into some perspective for you. Paintings got made on top of other paintings because the finished paintings were less valuable than a blank canvas. You would buy somebody's painting that was basically garbage, that was about as valuable as your general, you know, pony fan fiction, because the blank one was worth a lot more. And after people put the effort in and painted their paintings on top of it, it was pretty much worth a lot less. Again, millions of paintings were being made, just like there's millions of fanfics out there. I'm not sure if there's actually millions of fan... We're getting there. Pony writers are getting to the point of having millions of fanfics. It goes on from there. Hundreds of years later, surrealist painter Salvador Dali did an entire series of paintings based on the lace maker, which itself was based on another Dutch painter's painting. Dolly did things like the lace maker deconstructed into rhinoceros horn shapes because it seemed very important to him to repaint the lace maker as rhinoceros horn shapes. It's like, okay, <laughs> that's Dolly for you. But um, it's really hard to argue that that's not a kind of fan fiction. It goes deeper than that. It's not unreasonable to suggest that the Lord of the Rings is J.R.R. Tolkien's fanfic on the Icelandic sagas he so loved, complete with dragons. He and his friends at Oxford, I guess they were at Oxford, um, were known to have been fascinated by Icelandic sagas, and they wanted to get these things more appreciated by people, and thought that the best way to do that was to create their own thing around that and become what they'd like to call sub-creators. Just sort of bring that out so that it was no longer Icelandic Eddas that, in a language that most people couldn't understand. And they would translate these Icelandic Eddas hanging around in little literary clubs. They would translate the Icelandic Eddas over beer and stuff. It goes even deeper than that for Pony fans, anyhow. You could say that my Little Pony Friendship is Magic Itself, uh, Series 4, is Lauren Faust's original fanfic, or official fanfic, I should say, on the My Little Pony of her youth. You can't tell where the lightning is going to strike. You can't tell what's going to change people's lives and bring something special to them. And you can't go by, this is a completely original concept that nobody's ever... There aren't really original concepts that nobody ever has seen before. If they are, they're probably not awfully good. It's, the likelihood of genuinely original concepts being great is pretty weak. It's like saying, you know, genuinely original food with no proteins or flavors anybody's ever tasted before. That's not really what the culinary world is about. It's about implementation. It's about execution. Now, the question will become, since this is a panel about... Um, writing pony novels and executing on those, how do you do that? How do you do that really well? The answer is very simple. The answer is care about something. It pretty much doesn't matter what, just as long as you're not joking. The range of successful pony novels is just unbelievable. There's not a lot of restrictions. You don't even need to make it publishable, because you can't really make fanfiction pub publishable anyhow. It only has to be about the story. You have to care about the story. 
It can't just be that you want to be awesome and have lots of adoring fans. Of course you're awesome. Of course you want to be loved. So does everybody else. You've got to drop that and think to yourself, what kind of story do you love and want to see? You've got to be that story's first biggest fan before any pony else will perk up their ears, as us ponies do. Because it starts with your love. Not with your need for personal glory. Not with your ability, strangely enough. I'm going to stick to that point. It's not with your ability, but with your infatuation for something that needs to exist. Now here's a good way to figure that out. What that you can do upsets you the most when it's ignored and fails. You want to look for the stuff where you just die inside. It makes you bitter that it doesn't succeed. It deserves so much more. Maybe it deserves more than you can give it. Because you're going to have to put an unreasonable amount of love into this thing by the time you're done. It's a good sign if you get cranky that the thing that you care about doesn't get the love. It doesn't mean that that thing should get universal love. It might feel like it. It probably does feel like the thing that you care about that much needs to and should and deserves to get universal love, but no, it's, it's not going to. That's not how humanity works. Pon ponanity. <laughs> Something like that. What it means is that it's you that should be doing this thing. When you have that feeling like this deserves to see more justice than it gets, that means you're, you're the one that's supposed to be doing that. That's your signpost. Whether you feel you can do the thing justice is irrelevant. In some ways, that's just another signpost for you. Because no pony else particularly cares whether you can do this thing justice. All they care about is how well you tried. And they'll never know what it was meant to be. They'll never see your vision of it. They'll never feel what you feel inside about this thing. They're distracted and have a million things they're thinking about. And all they will ever know is what you were able to bring to the page. You know, and that can be alarming, but if you look at it in the context of how alarming it is compared to what your need is for the thing. If your vision is too grand to accomplish, it just makes for a lighthouse for you. It's just a way to guide you as you do your best with what you've got. Books, novels, are too big and complicated to survive without a real commitment from you to that particular story. You've got to want a particular book, not just, I want to have written a book. I mean, that's what NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month, is about. If you want to do something that's good and that people will really light up about and be excited about, you need to want a particular book. You've got to need it to turn out a certain way. It's personal. It starts with you sitting down and putting words together and not stopping. That's why you've got to have this need for it to be that way. I mentioned not stopping. That's kind of important as far as writing novels is concerned. Here's the thing about keeping on moving. You've really got to spend your time writing and not unwriting. I'll get into why the, um, this is a valid thing. It's not like writing poetry where you could be throwing out thing after thing until you get down to the one paragraph that is utterly perfect. Books don't really work that way. Books don't really work in a single perfect paragraph. In a way, a single perfect paragraph that jumps out and is so amazing, that's distracting to what the book's supposed to be. You want to be moving forward. You want to be writing rather than unwriting. That's got to be the priority. Get the big stuff right. Have an agenda about what you're trying to talk about. That's your job. You have to keep moving forward like a shark that will stop being a shark if it doesn't keep moving water through its gills. You can't just go back and keep doing the first sentence over and over until it's the perfect seed for a book and everything is wonderful. Like that opening where I read off first lines of things. And that really is my point. That... Um, these were the beginnings of amazing things, but you know, that wasn't the first Sherlock Holmes story. The first Sherlock Holmes story was a uh, study in Scarlet, and it goes on and on forever about Fifth Northumberland Fusiliers and a lot of boring stuff about Watson. And it's the second story, Sign of the Four, where it starts off with the, you know, focus on the hypodermic syringe as Sherlock Holmes removes it from its very fancy case. He's not some bum. And that says so much about who that character is. And it says so much about, you know, wh where he goes with that in the immediate paragraph succeeding that. It says so much about where he's going with this characterization and who this, you know, what this book is going to be about, what this character is going to be about. 
You know, a lot of those are first lines, but they're snapshots of where the authors wanted to go with their stories. Those authors knew what they wanted. They really had an idea in mind of what that story was supposed to be. The point is to get moving and stay moving rather than to just muddle around until you finally, you know, you're going to write, um, you're not going to write Study in Scarlet, you're going to write Sign of the Four first off. You're just going to start with the amazing first line and then you're going to do the ultimate book without doing anything else. It doesn't work that way. Forget it. That's not how it works. You might write six books before you write one that's really good, or it might be somewhere in the middle there. But the point is being the writer and doing the thing which is book writing, novel writing. You want to charge off on your adventure without worrying too hard about whether it's the most wonderful thing ever, because you can't be picky and choosy that way. Now, launching the book is an interesting subject all its own. My pet example for launching books is a pony book, because a lot of um, My Little Pony fans are familiar with this one. I fall back on Fallout Equestria. And the reason I like it so much is it does a thing that I like to call bootstrapping. It's taking little objectives and leading to bigger objectives. But it's not starting out with a whole bunch of world building and it's not expecting that you should be able to, you know, I had never, I knew nothing about Fallout when I read this book. All I knew was, here's this pony, because it's a pony novel, and she's sitting around repairing some kind of hoof device that goes on your forehoof, and suddenly this other pony shows up that she's crushing on madly and idolizes, asking for help in repairing a thing. So you immediately have an emotional agenda of like, okay, well, so this character that I'm following has a big crush, so you want her to get along with this stranger who's just appeared. Then, immediate twist. The pony that dropped off the device for her has suddenly fled outside the stable, fled outside the terrible concrete bunker that they all live in. What do we immediately conclude, and happily conclude, and we're entirely justified in concluding it, Little Pip's going to go after her. Little Pip is really fond of this pony, doesn't know what's happening, but seems like there's danger, and so something's going to happen, and we know what Little Pip's going to try to do, and that's exactly what she does. And she does not find Velvet Remedy immediately, but she finds all kinds of other stuff happening, and it's bootstrapping. It's little immediate objectives that are quickly leading to bigger and bigger objectives, and they all sort of line up. You start with some of these basic drives and some of these basic wants and go from there. I mean, if you can set up why a character wants and needs something, you've got it. That's the start for you right there. If you can set up the needs of several characters at once and show them conflicting, that's a story arc. And you got it twice. That's exactly what you need. You're developing their intention. They're trying to act on it. They're running into trouble. They're resolving it. An arc begins with the character forming an intention that the reader understands and can identify with. Fallout Equestria is a great example of that because it's really easy to understand what Little Pip's intention is. It's the most obvious thing in the world. Everything falls into place, so this pony has not only a desire to go and do something, but the means with which to do it. And we can also guess that she has no way of knowing what she's in for. And we're basically off and running. That's really what caused that particular book to take off as well as it did, was the fact that it just latched on and dragged you in. It's a very valuable thing. Now, Fallout Equestria has a grand overview, which is the whole post-apocalyptic, fallout, grim dark, all of that kind of stuff. And grand overview defines your theme, but you can't necessarily go at the theme directly. It didn't start off with, like, in a world where the ponies were grim and dark. It doesn't start off like that. Instead, it starts off with simple emotional needs and characters that are likable and understandable. Or characters that are doing something that is not understood, but you want to find out what's going on. If you... To have momentum at any point, there have to be clear stakes and something to want. It should be pretty obvious 
what your viewpoint character wants and is trying to accomplish. And as a writer, what you do is you throw in twists and confusion where the immediate thing that they do and what the reader intends to, for them to try. The reader's going to try to think of stuff for them to do, but, I mean, if, if the reader could tell you your story, they wouldn't have to read your book. They don't necessarily have the imagination to tell themselves a story that's as good as what you can tell, because that's your job. you got to think of stuff where the reader's going to want a particular outcome, yes, but then things develop in such a way that they go, oh my goodness, now what? Now what do we do? I know what I want to see happen, but I don't necessarily understand how that's going to transpire. This want, this desire for a particular outcome, is not necessarily the theme. It's the goal of the story arc, the immediate objective, whether that is like, we're going to take the ridge, or I want you to accept me being with my mare friend. And when I said leading the bigger objectives, that's not just about launching the book. Guess what? Everything has to work that way from the beginning of the book to the end. You might spend half your writing time thinking about how to fit things together so they constantly lead to the next chapter, and on and on to the ending. It's the sequence of things that happen, each of which lead to the next. That's how you develop a compelling story with narrative momentum, where you don't fall into that typical pony novel thing of, well, a bunch of stuff happened and I'm really not sure where this is going from here, it's possible to get stuff really rolling, to get a lot of momentum developing, and that works great. I'm here to tell you that works great as far as having people read your stuff and be like, I can't wait until Monday for the next chapter to come out. you, know, you got to be careful because sometimes they're just about ready to kill you to find out what happens next, although that would be the worst possible way to find out what happens next. You'd be like, I can't write anymore. <laughs> There's a mechanism by which these things connect together as well. And this is that's um, a great pleasure for me to bring to you. I didn't invent this. It was brought to me by a writer that I will link to in the um, notes for this YouTube video. I can, I can give you a variety of different links and URLs to go to, and I will do that. And a fellow, a blogger who also is on Twitter called Film... Crit Hulk. He's pretty cool. He basically is the Incredible Hulk as a film critic. He writes in all capital letters, and it's an affectation that helps you sort of think more clearly about what he does. And he's written an ungodly number of words about um, writing and narrative and story and all that kind of stuff. It's the most enlightening stuff I've ever seen in my life. It's great. But um, even he doesn't make everything up, and he linked to a NYU panel that was recorded in which the uh, writers Trey Parker and Matt Stone, you might recognize them from South Park, they turned up at this freshman writing class at NYU a few years ago and they dropped a bomb, and the bomb has to do with story structure. Their idea is, you want to join scenes together with the words therefore or but. And you do not want to join scenes together with the words, and then. You look at all of your, you know, each of your set pieces, each of your scenes, and look to how they would relate to each other. You go from the one to the next. Do you put the word, therefore, in between the two scenes, and then it's obvious where the next scene is going, because, therefore, you're dealing with exactly the consequences of what just happened. Or you're putting in but, and no, I don't mean plot, I mean but, beauty, and as such, it seems as if you're going one obvious direction and then something happens that clearly blocks what's supposed to be happening. The words and then are what you do when you're like, okay, and now I have to do the part where he loses the aged mentor and has to strike on his own and denies his call to heroism and all of that crap is um, basically the words and then. It's like, okay, and now I do this part and bear with me. Never do that. Your scenes and arcs can't just be a series of set pieces. The different parts have to mean something. Like you could do, for instance, Rainbow Dash is scared that she won't perform the Sonic Rainbow 
Therefore, she hides in the dressing room and won't come out. That's actually from the show. That is the therefore. Or, and this one's not in the show yet, Rainbow Dash is determined to perform the Sonic Rainbow, but she trains too hard and injures her wings. So that leads to another therefore immediately. Therefore, something goes wrong when she tries out. It ties the point of the scene to that which came before, and that's what you got to do. You'll begin to build everything up of this concept. Everything has to relate to what you're setting up. You devise these chain reactions where all the individual reactions are completely understandable, but the outcome is this titanic derp of a situation that no pony can deal with. And that's the easy part, but the fun part comes when you think out how they're going to fix it all and feel better assuming that's the kind of story you're telling. And that gets to theme, is whether that's the story you're telling. If you're doing it true to the basic feel of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, they'd better finish up by feeling better and having the happy ending, because that's kind of the point of the exercise. If you can pull some kind of victory out of a catastrophe in the process of happening, your readers will follow you anywhere especially if it makes sense, but they didn't see it coming. And they'll love you all the more if you've spelled out how it happens and they didn't spot it. It's very much like mystery writers. I'm bringing up mystery writers. Mystery writers do this for a living all day long. Their entire purpose is to simultaneously deliver a satisfying explanation and yet conceal it into the last minute. Used for a normal story, this technique produces drama because you're establishing strong intentions for the characters, but it's not obvious how they're going to carry those intentions out. I'll talk a little bit about some of my writing. I'm not going to go into detail. No good would come of that. But the biggest violation of the and-then concept I ever had was in my first book, Tri Trixie's Magic Bed. Not my first, my first pony, pony book. Where Trixie comes to town, shall we say, and all the ponies are enchanted and hypnotized, let's just say. Now, this scene, this chapter, was a fun, crazy table flip. It was, I had to throw in italicized stuff in the beginning, implying that there was creepy hypnotic stuff going on, just because the first time I put out the chapter, I didn't even have that. I wanted it to be a complete rug pull underneath the reader, and boy, was it ever. <laughs> My readers flipped out so badly, I was, you know, they were going to hunt me down and kill me for it. And I had to at least spell out, like, oh, okay, this is a crazy rug pull. It seemed like there was no logic, that it was completely out of left field, that I was changing the rules on them. By the terms of the story, it was a cheat. It was unacceptable. But hear me out. That same annoying table flip, and the situation that all that craziness produced, set up the biggest therefore of them all. It was the fiercest need of all. It left one of my ponies, Twilight specifically, faced with a completely impossible situation. To her, the result after the chapter was finished was exactly as unacceptable as the event that kicked off the chapter. You watch her realize just how much she's lost. You can almost see her go, therefore, and she confronts Trixie, who's randomly appeared in the story, and she's like, we need to talk. She won't accept what just happened in that chapter. She's fighting back. And then the next scene spells out in detail exactly what she's proposing to do, and it's all one big therefore leading to some really, really scary places, all tied directly to the same conflict that the characters were experiencing all along. And that's also pretty crucial as far as the, the big table flip um, scenes and stuff. The only reason I even got away with it was because it ties right back to all the same problems. And uh, I more than got away with it. Um, that was a toll booth through which I had to go to get to a completely different ending to the book. There was fuel for lots of more stories, entire relationships that wouldn't have existed without it. That was when that book turned into a series, when it, you know, grew depth, where suddenly there was a lot more to do with it all. Exactly at that same moment that every pony loves to gripe about that it was a completely stupid table flip of a random and then. You can try to prepare readers for stuff, but anytime you try anything really challenging, you're always going to lose some of them. 
not everybody quite gets that, but it's a really important point. Therefore, you have to decide what audience you do and don't want. If you can be clear on who you don't want as a reader, you don't have to be angry with them when they don't want you either. You might perform like a champion in literary terms, but you're overlooking kids who can't read or do grammar. You're overlooking casual readers, people who have fierce agendas of their own that might conflict with yours. And this also applies to your choice of writing style. Style doesn't always mean purple prose. Stephen King has a style that's very direct and blunt. It's the events of his story that drive his work. I like to, I like to go along with the Stephen King thing a lot. I like keeping stuff really simple. Sometimes it's the concepts and consequences that drive a book. Some truly gifted stylists have had trouble keeping momentum when they had to maintain a purple prose style for the length of an entire book. I've seen that a lot. I've seen a lot of stuff where you immediately look at the story and it's a charming, engaging style which is full of all sorts of detail and it really has this flavor to it and you're not really quite sure where you are because the detail of the actual paragraphs and stuff is so interesting and fun to read that it's a little confusing and it's hard to tell exactly who means what because you're just so engaged by how everything's being told. Stephen King doesn't do that. His stuff is boring. You're going to need to have many things happening in a full-length book. Your efforts are going to be towards keeping the reader up to speed with it all, rather, you know, keeping track of everything that you're trying to convey, which could be on a lot of different levels. And that's the secret to the boring Stephen King style writing that's, you know, so... Placid's not the word that I'm looking for. It's the... general and overly direct. Sometimes you're going to be using very ordinary words, very plain events, because at that point it's not about the language. It's about what happened in the story. That can be a way to get through slow writing days. Just write the next thing that happens in the story simply, or it can be used as dramatic effect. Now, don't underestimate that using that technique to get through slow writing days. Stephen King talks about how you can um, get through stuff by just what's the next thing that happens in the story. If it's a flashback, like he, he points out, if it's a flashback, the next thing that happens is somebody remembers. There's usually a next thing that happens that you can figure out without too much trouble. And you're probably getting stuck because you need to be expressing this thing more interestingly than it is. It might not be an interesting thing. It, may, it might, okay, they walked over to Carousel Boutique and you're stuck because you're like, how am I supposed to make that interesting? You can't, it's not interesting. What's interesting is how the pony feels once she gets to Carousel Boutique and has the conversation that you know she's going to have there and you're overly hung up on trying to make those things that happen really interesting. And what's really going to have to happen is those are some boring paragraphs and the person's just going to read through them like butter. You know, like grass through a goose, not a goose, a goose. They're going to just go, Foom, and it's going to be over and they are going to understand exactly where your character is, and that's the important part. You can also use this simplicity technique as stylistic effect, and that should not be underestimated. It's super useful to be able to kind of strike like lightning and hit with very blunt direct stuff by contrast contrast with very purple stuff. I have a sequence that I can use and take that apart intentionally, not even totally spoil it because you won't know everything about it. And it's a bit that I can actually talk about as well, which is unusual for my stories. In the ending of Rarity's Worst Day Ever, Twilight's fighting a princess. I'm not going to tell you which one. A princess. She's in a mage wrestle with a full-grown alicorn, and she might win. A lot of the stuff leading up to the high drama moment is fairly purple in its prose. For instance, I'm describing Twilight as a magical killing machine fit to destroy an alicorn, something without a heart to break or a shred of mercy to distract her from her task. Now, that, that's an unsympathetic description, though. That's unpony-like. Twilight's not supposed to be like that. That's not our little nerdy unicorn. 
It's not good for her to be like that. But the audience is still wanting Twy to prevail. It's been set up in such a way that the audience completely wants her to be victorious. There's every reason to want her to win. Rainbow Dash is present in this scene. She's clinging to a pony corpse, or what she thinks is a pony corpse. And her final cries are purple prose in the extreme. They're, they're purple prose exaggeratedly that I could easily have dialed back on. I chose not to because I knew what was about to happen. And then the clincher to that sequence is completely terse on purpose. We've got Dash setting up the terseness by going in the other direction just to make the contrast. And Dash's scream of grief, speaking of agony too terrible to be born, she tilted her head back and cried out to the air somewhere beyond the rocky ceiling that proved the tomb of all her dreams. Twilight glanced to the side. Just for an instant, her heart rung. Twilight went down. Three words, no flowers. Blunt, harsh, unforgivingly factual. Terse is a strobe. Terse is the flash that illuminates. But what it illuminates is the pictures you've built in the reader's mind, and you need the purple side of the force for that. If you're always at the same level of directness or purpleness, like you're trying to hone the exact amount you need, and I see this in I see this sometimes in really good writers who have a wonderful, interesting, engaging style that every paragraph has fascinating, you know, word candy for you. It seems as if they're trying to have all of their paragraphs and sentences just bring that for the reader. It's a mistake. That's not right. The scene should be telling you what it needs. Think about it. You can cut to different forms of expressiveness, like different camera angles. You don't actually want to search for the perfect style. You want to be covering a range, and that brings a whole new freedom. It should bring a whole new freedom. It should make it easier. You don't have to force things into a particular angle or a particular style. You're there searching for what that particular scene is trying to become. Just like criticizing pony writing and reading folks as they do what they do, you want to be able to look for what that story is trying to become. You know, rather than feeling like you have to focus down to the perfect stylistic blend, this concept should tell you that you have room to move. And it's not even from writing. This concept is from cooking. It's called amplitude. It means the greatest intensity is achieved from a blending of elements so that the experience is broad, rich, and complex, not just narrow and easily identified. Amplitude is not being immersed in any one style or mode. Like, Heinz ketchup is the example of this from cooking. You might not know it about uh, ketchup, but there's a reason why there's basically just one kind of ketchup. You've got Heinz, and then there's the supermarket brand that nobody buys, and so on and so forth. That's not marketing. That's balance. Heinz ketchup has sweet, bitter, salty, sour, umami. Those are all flavored types. Um, umami is the flavor. It not, has nothing to do with Yomama. Umami is the flavor like the richness of chicken soup or uh, monosodium glutamate brings pure umami to a thing. And Heinz ketchup has a incredibly good balance of all of these things. It has such a good balance that it's hard to pin down whether it has any sweetness or saltiness or bitterness at all. It merges together into something that's hard to describe and has its own distinct quality. And that's pretty much what you gotta do with the writing, not by getting that one perfect style, but by setting up that imaginary world using all those different ways so that the world gives its own distinct flavor that can't easily be mistaken for anything else. It's sort of like a you'll know it when you see it kind of scenario. If you're able to do that, you start getting this feeling that like, oh yeah, it's like hitting a baseball with the baseball bat. Ding! You know if you've really nailed it. And then the rest of the stuff, you tell yourself like, Okay, well, some of these can be boring so that people can breathe, and I'll use a couple of paragraphs just to get my feet back under me again, and so on and so forth, and you just keep going. This concept is going to have a profound effect in how you think about revising as well, polishing and perfecting work. If revising seems hard and like no fun, I've got some bad news, but I've also got some good news. Bad news is this, stuff is always going to get by you. I'm a pretty good proofreader. I've done it for a lot of folks. I've done it for a published um, furry publisher. Didn't get a lot of good credits with that, but um, I did that. I did an anthology for one of the furry publishers. 
And there was a time when I got involved in this argument in FIM fiction. And I thought I could say, well, you can do what you like. I mean, you don't have to proofread everything perfectly, but I'd defy any pony to find one grammatical error in my first book, Trixie's Magic Bit. You can probably see where this story's going. A pony went and found a grammatical error in the first sentence of the first chapter, the first paragraph of the first chapter of the first book, within like five minutes. I couldn't believe it. It was a double space where a single space should be. I hadn't been thinking about that stuff. That had gotten by me, that had gotten by thousands of readers, thousands of people who would criticize it and said you should change this and this and this and this. Nobody had spotted it, and this one fellow went and he spotted it. There's always going to be derps. No matter what you do, there's always going to be something still in there. Generally, published books also have that, although they're much better about avoiding it. And you should still try to fix these derps, but there's no sense freaking out about them because they're always going to be with you. The good news is the goal of revision might not be what you think it is. If you're writing from confidence and you're revising also from confidence, then the revision process becomes just another extension of the creative spark. And you're not trying to grind out all possible mistakes that any pony might have with it. You're trying to bring out the essence of wherever you're at. You want to heighten the resonance and make it play its role in the larger picture. Just like what I was talking about with the amplitude and stuff. Essentially, you're in the role of your ideal reader. It's that concept of, you know, the super fan, the one that really understands everything that you're trying, everything that you're trying to lay down. It might sound kind of counterintuitive, but you want to be in the role of that ideal reader not in the role of your ideal hater that finds every problem that you could possibly have. You're trying to make your book more awesome, not less terrible. There's a big, big difference. And that's amplitude. That's the reason that you're going at this and trying to find the stuff that resonates. You're trying to seize the moment. Eradicating all possible error, well, sure, misspellings, yeah, fine. But error, there could be any number of definitions of error fix your spelling derps, but when it comes down to the stylistic stuff that's more debatable, that's when you're aiming for that one pony that's going to be just floored by it. That's when you're going to fall back in your theme and your purpose about the high, as the highest authority. I'm mentioning theme. This is probably a good time to get into theme. Now, theme is what do all of your horse words say about your world? For instance, some, some themes might be victory through violence is meaningless. Or, be romantic, throw your family to the timber walls for love. Nobody said themes had to be sensible. They just have to be sincere. Themes do have to be sincere. Your theme can be dumb, and that's okay if you, just, if you enjoy it a whole lot. I mean, themes like the vibe, it's the why of it all. It's where you're going with, you know, the stories that you're telling. You've got to have your who wants what. You've got to have your clear intentions of the characters, but whether they succeed or fail, that tells another kind of story. And it's not really arbitrary. You can't just start off like, okay, uh, I'm writing a red and black alicorn that every pony loves and they win everything because they're truly awesome, except for they're very humble about how awesome they are because they're really a nice guy. You know, then somebody, because that really sucks, dude. And you go, okay, uh, they lose and they're really sad. That's better, right? No, no, you're missing the point. First of all, other people don't necessarily get to tell you whether your theme is the one you're supposed to have, because that's the one thing they can't really change about you. And secondly, you know, what does making it so arbitrary have to say about your world? Like if your red and black alicorn OC wins, what does that say about your world? If they lose in their release ad, what does that say? If they, you know, if they can't save the day, what does that have to say about humility or maybe despair? Is humility or despair really what you're trying to talk about in a book? A theme can be really dumb and childish, as long as you enjoy it. Kicking total ass counts as a theme. Feeling like a little pawn in a game too large to understand counts as a theme. Um, 
blowing the heads off of people who are irredeemably wicked because blowing the heads off of wicked people is cool counts as a theme. Tom Clancy ran with that completely annoyingly for book after book. And I have one of his that's actually Rainbow Six kicking around as a sort of living example to me of how if you're sincere about a theme, it doesn't matter how crap that the theme really is. It could be the most pathetic, sociopathic thing in the world, but if that's what you really mean, then hey, it's probably going to resonate with people. It does not have to be a fancy thing. It does not have to be a deep and bitter and grim dark thing in order to be valid. I like working together for love and friendship was the theme of the My Little Pony pilot, and that's expressed through scene after scene through the entire first series and onwards. You could say that they, if the more they lost track of that or didn't focus on it so specifically, the more they kind of lost track of the My Little Pony, and I'm guessing they're going to continue having that to be important. Now, if you're writing a book, you got to do a thing which we hope that the My Little Pony series doesn't end up having to do. Ending. Film Crit Hulk likes to say, ending is the conceit. Your ending is your conceit. Whether it's a specific set of events or an overall tone, you want to get conscious about what you ha need to have happen in this ending. You're building towards it constantly, with little tints and tip-offs. You know, it could be a big help adding texture and depth to a scene if you're doing the scene in the middle of everything, but you know that you're leading towards a particular ending and that that's going to have to make sense for people. I mean, your little cameos of details, it works really great if they relate to where you're leading everything. That's a, a super useful trick. And the ending has to deal with what the story is really about. That's why we were talking about theme. Theme is what the story is really about. And it works best if you understand what your theme is. It doesn't have to be a mystery to you in order to be artistically valid. In fact, I would say that that was a big handicap. Following your artistic muse shouldn't necessarily be like, oh, it's a big mystery, and I don't know where the darkness of the story is leading somewhere that's going to be an incredibly enlightening thing. You might as well make it up, you know. You might as well have a fixed intention about where you're trying to go. you got to decide somewhere. And you also have to decide a particular main thing that's going to be your main ending. I mean, no book ends up perfectly free of hanging threads and details. Enjoy having those. Those are basically sequel bait. Those are like, you can build other books out of those. That stuff continues onwards and people go, oh, that, I was hoping to hear about that. But you only get one final scene. You only get one final sentence. And if you're working towards building that final scene that ties into the theme of what you mean the book to be about, and you're good enough to build it down towards the final sentence that just caps it off, that's a really effective way to end stuff. That's a way to end stuff where people will not go well, it was pretty cool, but the ending kind of fizzled. And it's, you, can, you can take that as far as you want. It's possible to, to really build it up and have it be very exciting. Now, let's suppose you did that. Let's suppose you started your book. You wrote rather than unwriting. You picked something that you cared about. So, because pick something that you really care about and you stuck to it. You worked away until you were finished. You write that final sentence and you're done. You've written a novel. That's awesome. First one is the toughest, and first one is also usually the derpiest, and that's fine. Now that you finished it, will every pony like it? I bet you realize where I'm going with this. No, 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 no. Not every pony will like it. Nothing pleases everybody. That's the nature of making a thing. You can just run with that and deal with, you know, you can call them critics as best that you can. Now, it also leads us to an interesting question of how do you incorporate criticism without just turning stuff over to a committee of your readers? And that's a really good question. You want to be able to look at criticism and have it be useful rather than just hurtful, because nobody wants to go around being hurt all the time. Hurt and feeling 
you know, disemboweled by your critics can just stop people from writing at all, especially if you're trying to find confidence in writing, which is very important. The angle you want to use for dealing with this is criticism is perspective on how well you're executing your intentions. That's pretty much all it is. It's very useful perspective, and sometimes it is perspective from viewpoints you can't possibly begin to understand. Viewpoints that you shouldn't understand. You know, thanks to criticism, you can get a background, you can get a point of view that you're not supposed to be able to understand. That's a huge resource. It really is a powerful resource. But because you're not supposed to understand and relate to absolutely every pony in the world, that also means that it's not about removing all reported mistakes that any pony comes up and claims that you have. Criticism is about the additive. It is about discovery. You're making stuff up. You need a lot of stuff in a book. You have to tie it together. You have to tie it together with those therefore and but, and all of your attention is going to be on this tying together. You can't waste time and energy fretting about whether your basic ideas are unsound. You know, it's sort of this existential thing of like, well, but am I even valid as a human being to be allowed to write? Am I even entitled to have an idea? Well, you better. You better just sort of uh, relax to it and be like, I'm going to have to have an idea, and it's going to be a strongly held idea, and I'm going to write the heck out of it. You can't be thrown by worrying about whether your basic ideas are unsound, whether your basic themes are unsound, and especially you can't be thrown by the existence of folks who consider that your basic ideas are unsound. Because I hate to break it to you, but if you've got good writing, good writing that is distinct and is making points and really is, you know, thought-provoking, stuff is going on in there, and you've got 10 readers, just 10, 10 readers, probably one of them will consider the basic ideas unsound. And I'm not even talking haters who saw your stuff and they thought that you, you sucked and they left. I'm talking 10 continuing readers, 10 of your fans that presumably you want to write. You're probably going to lose one of them on some of your, some of your stuff. I don't think totally inoffensive stuff stays with readers as well as stuff that takes risks. I mean, there's always, there's a few ponies that are naturally so nice that they write stories that are super nice and every pony seems to like them. And there's very little to be offended by in any of that. And that's all well and good. Some of them are even quite popular, but I don't think that's something you get to choose. If you were that pony, I probably like you very much too. You're completely awesome. Be loved by those around you, because the more people like you, the better. But the rest of us, nah, nah, we're going to have to deal with who we are. Kind of like, you know, heck, even, even Fluttershy in the show can be pretty obnoxious. And some of us are like Rainbow Dash or Applejack or whatever. And we're just going to have to deal with the fact that we rub some folk the wrong way. You can choose how you interact with your audience, but you can't choose your muse. Now, when I talk about this 1 in 10, what I'm really talking about is your muse. It's not you that necessarily gets the haters. It's not necessarily you that gets that 1 in 10 that is like, I'm offended. It's your muse. You don't have to act as if you are emotionally your muse. You can choose how you interact with your audience. The muse is going to be more personal. You're going to have to use what you've got, even if it gets you some haters. I look for that 10 to 1 ratio myself. Honestly, I do. A lot of the times, the folks that hate what I write have no problem with me as a person. Or if they've met me and they've talked to me, they don't necessarily have a problem with me as a person. And they can still have big problems with what I write. And that's okay with me, because we don't see eye to eye on the content. We never will. And that's going to be okay. If you're writing properly, the flip side of this, and I believe this as well, for every dedicated hater that's also a continuing reader, that same idea will find somebody who's become a raving fan. It balances out. You can't really have the one without the other. And there's nothing as valuable as a total fan. Imagine you've got two readers. One of them is your total fan, and one of them tends to not like you very much. 
you're doing some crazy thing, like I mentioned that table flip moment in Trixie. Um, your story is at 95% with the first one, and the other one's a very different pony, and that will give it, they're, they're going to give it like 30%. They think it's broken and suggest big changes. Your chapter in which you did this thing that was very daring, and I've, as the last you know, I've done lots of that. You can push this chapter like 10% maybe in any direction. You've just finished it. You got a couple hours where you're looking at it with fresh eyes and people are seeing it and they're responding in different ways. And you're allowed to go back and go, okay, well, edit, 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 edit. Now what do you think? Thing is, what you do is going to affect each reader oppositely. You've got your big fan and you've got your big hater. To delight your big fan is going to be pretty easy, but to reach the hater is going to be a huge struggle because they already don't like what you like. They don't understand what you understand. It's hard for you to understand them. And even if you try, it's kind of, you know, you're going, do I really want to deal with this world? I don't know. So do you try to avoid your criticism and struggle to get your hater to like it only 40%? Push a 10% from 30 to 40. As you're doing that, you're a huge fan that's at 95%, it's affecting them oppositely. They're gonna to drop to 85%. They're still gonna be basically okay, but you're trying to play the averages there. You're trying to get the generalized thing that shouldn't be offending any pony, or you could go the opposite way. The hater goes from 30% to 20%. They now think you're the biggest idiot in Equestria, but your reader at 95%, you just took them to 105% and they have just had a reading peak experience that's going to stay with them for the rest of their life. Which do you choose? It shouldn't even be a choice. It really shouldn't. You got to go with your fan. You got to knock it out of the park for your fan. Don't even spare a thought for the other guy. You know, be sympathetic to their feelings of it's not really hurting them very much. They're just enjoying being a hater, whatever. It's your story, not everybody gets to steer. Don't get mad at the hater, they're just as sincere. Rather than fight them, what you should do is something that's even harder. Even if you are taking them from 30% to 20% and you're making choices that you know they're not gonna be able to live with, you do something that's even harder and that is listen. Because flames and criticism can show you exactly who you're not writing for, but more than that, they can give you a perspective on how well you're executing your story arcs. The folks that you lose will show you the quickest where you're at, the boundaries around what you're doing. You don't obey critics when they say, okay, make this be a completely other kind of story. Oh, and less commas. What you do is seek to understand what tripped them up. It's probably a blind spot for you. You can admit you're doing that too. You don't have to pretend you're not using the criticism to improve your thing. You can say you had something else in mind and try to get it across better. Even be sorry you didn't communicate it well enough without being sorry about your story itself because that's your muse. You can't help that. You're like, sorry, my muse is a dick. <laughs> You're just getting continuing feedback and where your audience actually is rather than guessing. You can also use critics to develop your effectiveness or to get some perhaps painful insight into your real motivations. But once you've got that sorted out, you do have to go with your motivations because they are yours. If a critic has jumped on you because you've written yourself as a red and black alicorn, beloved by all, but your life sucks because of how unsatisfied you are with your own great awesomeness, fine, oh well. Learn the handicaps of that approach. Figure out what is throwing people the most easily and find ways of dealing with it, but overcome them, but keep the audacity of the thing. You started doing that for a reason. You don't just throw it away because to some people it sucks. People like all different kinds of stuff. Ponies like all different kinds of stuff. Nothing is unwritable. You just have to have a broad enough perspective that you can comprehend where the audience is so you can go and get them and bring them on your journey if they're willing to go to it. The audience is not stupid. They're just looking to be distracted. They've got a lot in their mind. They're not a blank slate. They have all kinds of things they're thinking about and you do have to go and get them and lead them along, herd them, as it were, to where you need them to go. See, if you're going somewhere with the story and too much of the audience won't go, the thing to do is to look back and figure out where you skipped over stuff, 
where the stones were set so widely apart that they couldn't jump them. Now, if my tone changed here, it's because the computer ate half of my recording, so I have to re-record it over again. Anyway, we'll carry on. I was just getting to talking about the public long-form writing, because essentially what we're doing here with the pony stuff is public long-form writing. We have FIM fiction. We can write stuff and put it up and have a whole bunch of people commenting on chapters even as we do them. We don't actually even have to finish the entire book before we get lots of immediate feedback. Seems like a pretty internet thing, right? Seems like uh, fancy modern technological advancements. Well, I think you'll find actually that there's a lot of historical precedent. Many classic literary communities from the Algonquin Rhine Table to the Cradle of Cyberpunk in Austin, they were just the same thing. They were communities in which writers got to hear from each other in an audience as they were doing stuff. And stories evolved in the context of people being able to hear them. Or the Inklings. Have you ever heard of the Inklings? Lord of the Rings was read aloud to the Inklings while it was written because the Inklings was the little literary group that met in bars and hung out of J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, Warney Lewis, his brother, a, variety, a, a bunch of other guys, some um, Oxford professors. They were a community of their own, They're much smaller than FIM fiction, but they were a small literary community. And it was... Um, Essentially, um, Icelandic fanfiction community, because Tolkien had the Icelandic fanfiction thing going on, and that was his big love. In fact, that was C.S. Lewis's C.S. C.S. Lewis's big love as well was the Icelandic sagas, these amazing stories, and dragons. Of course, they had to have dragons. And who could be really surprised when it turns out that? Um, Tolkien ended up writing his own fan fiction of these uh, sagas and Icelandic things with his own dragons and trolls and elves and things. Strider was once called Trotter. If Tolkien was one of us and writing for the My Little Pony thing, I'm sure that Strider would still be called Trotter, but that's a little bit beside the point. What is very much to the point is that Tolkien even had haters. I mentioned the 1 in 10 thing where you'd have one in ten uh, readers that were legitimate readers who absolutely despised your stuff or completely loved it. Tolkien had that, even in a group as small as the Inklings. He, he had um, those wonderful and frustrating readers, and they're your biggest fans, and they also give you lots of criticism and feedback. He had that in C.S. Lewis. Lewis would write extensive, elaborate critiques of Lord of the Rings stuff and Silmarillion and all that kind of stuff. And he would give elaborate um, solutions to the problems that he found, and Tolkien would be like, what? Leave me alone. What is this? Going, That's not going in my story. It was very much the same, very much the same dynamic. Tolkien even had haters. Some of the Inklings... They just wanted to sit around drinking beer in their pub and argue about politics or philosophy. You know, they didn't want these long orc stories. They got fed up with them. Towards the end of the Inklings meeting, they had asked Tolkien to stop reading his stuff with them, even to have his son read it. Uh, Christopher Tolkien was reading them. Tolkien finished his books on his own after they were shaped by that original, earlier Inklings feedback. He never did win over every single one of them. Thing is, all of this stuff, it doesn't take courage. Courage is not exactly the thing to have with this. I mean, you might need courage to face your audience if you're trying to do something ambitious and weird. You might need courage to get through your initial part where you're still figuring out who you are and what you're trying to write. But as far as going forward and doing it once you've gotten a handle on things, no, it's your story, it's not the audience's. It doesn't require courage to go forward with it. If they could tell themselves a story, they would just do that. They wouldn't need you. It's not a thing of um, 
being able to deliver the story the way the audience expects and wants it to go. They would rather you tell your story in such a way that they get pleasantly surprised by stuff that happens, that they didn't really have it all that figured out in the first place. And to be able to do that, you have to be writing with confidence. Your stuff won't sing unless it's confident. You gotta find a place that is unworried so you can tell your story and be confident that it is your story. That's what resonates. And resonance is what really nails it for people. That's a common factor in so many successful writers, notably pony writers. They have the confidence. Confidence means you're doing it the way that you would do it without a lot of second guessing. This, this also counts for the guys that you can't figure out, and I'm not going to name any of them, and it's just purely subjective opinion anyhow, but the guys that you can't figure out, how did this person get so popular? They have all kinds of grammatical problems, or this stuff is very much a red and black alicorn OC that's awesome, and everybody immediately falls in love with them, and there's no problems with them except for that they're very humble. People like that stuff to the extent that the writer is confident in it. It might not be all the best people. I'm really proud of my reader list. <laughs> I have the awesomest reader list ever. But um, it's okay to have a big, huge reader list twice or three times the size of mine, and folks have, that is just a bunch of kids that want to read about the red and black alicorn OC because they want to be that guy. That's okay, too. If you were a writer and you're writing that stuff with confidence, those people are going to flock to you big time, and you're really serving a purpose. You're bringing something that somebody needs to have in their lives. As far as the critics are concerned, you don't have to scorn them, you don't have to hate them, you don't have to be mean to them or, you know, invalidate them and stuff. You can be completely kind. You basically go, okay, well, um, I really appreciate hearing from you because it helps me understand where people come from because I can't be too blinded by my own vision. That said, it is still my own vision. And this is my story that I'm trying to tell. I've got a pretty good idea of what I'm trying to accomplish. You've given me some hint, hints, some pointers on where I might have been overlooking things that I really kind of need to include. I'll work on that. Thanks for the perspective. Seriously, I'll take it from here. Now, let's suppose you do all of these things. You write a book. It's a personal book. It's your story. You absolutely nail it for your fans. You take all the 95% folks to 105% and you aim stuff for them. Now you're wondering what the reward is. What can you get out of all this? What can, what can you get about doing this? Whether it's like, you know, publishable fiction or whether it's fan fiction, any of that. Well, let me tell you about a guy I know named Ari Lafferty. I discovered this writer when I was a kid in high school. He wrote short stories like nothing I'd ever seen. The freedom this guy created was amazing. Well, at the same time, it felt strangely important to me. There were these two books in the school library. It's a Reader's Guide to Science Fiction and a Reader's Guide to Fantasy. I stole them. The reason I did that, and it's a private school, so in some sense they're paid for. I'm sure the statute of limitations has expired, I hope. More importantly, I'm totally unrepentant of that crime. I would do it again, because these things have helped me define who I want to be. I have them here. Here they are. Lafferty is in both of them. Ari Lafferty is in the science fiction, and he is in the fantasy book for the same stories and books. Here's a bit of what the science fiction one has to say about him. Lafferty. Ari Lafferty is possessed, a madman, a wild talent. He has created a grammar and syntax all his own, virtually a language all his own, despite the fact that taken one by one all the words he uses are English. One simply cannot begin a Lafferty story and mistake it for anyone else's. Sounds pretty good already. Goes on from there. And then ends with, Lafferty is fun, sophisticated, and utterly insane. There is no one who writes like R.A. Lafferty, so if you like one of his books, find some more. Now, my point with this being, this book is filled with credits. Like, this is Alan E. Norse. It says... If you like Norse, you should try Murray Leinster's Med Surface series and the writing of James White. Or you got E. E. Doc Smith. E. E. Doc Smith is cool, a space opera. If you enjoy E. E. Doc Smith, we suggest Van Vogt, Ed Hamilton, John Rankin, Bellstar, or Leigh Brackett. 
This entire book is full of that. This entire book is full of that. Ariel Lafferty is the only writer in either book in which anybody has said, there is no one who writes like Ariel Lafferty, so if you like one of his books, find some more. That's what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wanted to be that guy. I like the fact that they called him insane. I figured I was insane as well, so I was going to be stuck with it. But could I be insane in a way that was cool? This was cool. This stuff with this guy and his writing, that was incredibly cool. And I got a paperback book by him at one point. It's a thing called Fourth Mansions, an actual novel. Here it is. You can see that it's not your usual book. Check this cover out. Now, is that an interesting cover or what? And it's very well chosen as well. The books really like this cover. You can see it's pretty weather beaten. I've owned this for a long time. Some old fart. I'm going to read you the very beginning of this book because I talked about beginnings and the very beginning of this uh, presentation, which was a BronyCon panel. It's run a little bit over because the panel had to be an hour. And on YouTube, I can get away with running a little over that. I talked all about beginnings and starts. And I read the beginnings of a bunch of books. And I'm going to read the beginning of this one. It begins, I think I will dismember the world with my hands. For there are also, quote, for there are all these obstacles for us to meet, and there is also the danger of serpents. Unquote. Interior Castle, Teresa of Avila. There is entwined seven tentacled lightning. It is fire masses, it is sheets, it is arms. It is seven colored writhing in the darkness, electric and alive. It pulsates, it sends, it sparkles, it blinds, it explodes. It is seven murderous thunder snakes striking in seven directions along the ground, blindingly fast, under your feet, now, at you. And you, you who glanced in here for but a moment, you were already snake bit. It is too late for you to withdraw. The damage is done to you. That faintly odd paste in your mouth, that smallest of tingles which you feel, they signal the snake death. Die a little. There is reason for it. R. A. Lafferty, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, now, let's step back a little. There aren't that many copies of this book out there. You can see it's pretty old. You can see it's pretty beat up. When I found it, I went, eee, oh my god, and I grabbed it immediately and bought it because it was in a store. And I haven't ever seen it anywhere else in any other store. There's a reason for that. It's a pretty weird book. That's why I loved it. You could tell that it was pretty weird. It only gets weirder from there believe it or not, by fan fiction standards, any of you guys would tear him apart. Lafferty doesn't stand up to, to criticism very well. Characters that he does are just very strange. It's kind of stilted and awkward. It would never win a fan fiction contest. You could say he woefully needed an editor, but that wouldn't have worked. He was building imaginary worlds off of stuff he cared about. Teresa of Avila was real. She was a Catholic mystic. He was a Catholic guy. She wrote a book about the soul as a crystal globe containing a castle built of seven mansions, which were parts of a journey of faith. It's an allegorical thing. You couldn't go and tell Lafferty, oh, mansions is dumb. Pick a better word. Lose some of this freaky stuff. You're going to lose your audience. And mansions is not a very good word for books. You know, dark sells better. He had other things going on. That wasn't going to be negotiable. Lafferty died in 2002. He'd only started writing when he was over 40, and he was 54 by the time his first book got published, and he was still working as an electrical engineer for years after that. He was working as an electrical engineer when he was nominated for a Hugo for Past Master. He was nominated for a Hugo and a Nebula for Fourth Mansions. While working as this electrical engineer, he'd written nine books, nine books, one of them a nonfiction about the fall of Rome by 1972, while working his day job as an electrical engineer. They all went out of print. Publishers wouldn't touch him. He was too strange. He did 12 short stories collections after that, 167 stories, because at least he could sell those. And he lived humbly with his sister until he died. 
R.A. Lafferty is not a J.K. Rowling story. You're not going to be a J.K. Rowling story either. But wait, let's go back a bit again. When I was a kid in high school, I discovered R.A. Lafferty. He had a dream and he wrote stuff nobody had ever seen before. I wanted to be like him, and it changed my life. I stole books out of my high school because they said that he was unique and nothing else was like him. I needed to have those reminders, not only of his writing, but also of what I wanted to be, that you could be that, that people could see that in you. That writer was one of the things that kept me alive when I was a teenager. And through all the turbulence of my life, this stuff has been there as an anchor, showing me the way, showing me what freedom in creativity could mean. He saved my life. And he, combined with the teacher who believed that I could write and told me so, hi Warren, this guy named Warren Carberg, that I'll never forget, helped me through the first million words or so of my own writing, and it's still helping me to this day. I feel in some ways like Ari Lafferty is here with me now, and he'd probably find this a fitting tribute because he always had bigger fish to fry than simply making money. This you can do. This you can have if you want it enough. So write what you really care about, seriously. Now when I criticize, I always try to single out some good thing in a writer and praise it in terms that they won't soon forget because that stuff becomes the anchor for your daring. You go sort of, well, at least I can, and you fill in the blank, and you go from there. You start from that courage and you move on to confidence. You dare to dream things. Then you buckle down and you reinforce that dream. You guide it and direct the reader through it. The fundamental dream has to have its own heartbeat. Don't choke it by throwing critics at it unless you're prepared to take your dream side. It's not about you and your awesomeness, it never is. It's about the thing that you're imagining. You're just a conduit. So here's what I'm gonna leave you with. Be an armored conduit. You know what an armored conduit is, right? It's those um, metal tube things in the wall that you run electrical wires through, and if you're drilling through, you'll bounce off of that, and you won't hurt the electricity. Well, your story is the electricity, you're just the conduit. If somebody attacks you, oh well, you got to take that without letting it hurt the electricity of the story. That's your job. Learn how to best shape this thing that you need to make real. You go and do that. Never forget that your first duty is to protect that dream and bring it forth. Even if it's a really unique and special dream that deserves to live, it can't defend you. You're there to defend it. You have to defend and grow it. That's your job as a novelist, and you can do it. One seemingly ordinary word at a time. Now, go out there and write stories about ponies. <laughs>